Well, let's say an opening prayer and then we'll begin. You ready? Most precious, almighty, heavenly Father, we come before you at this time to thank you for your grace, mercy, and love and for being with us. We hate being apart, but we appreciate that we can at least talk to each other with this technology, and we pray that you will guide us and direct us and help us to be strong in you and to serve one another with gladness. We pray that you would help us be lights in these last days that everybody we know who's friends or family or neighbors, we will encourage them and say this is a time for people to turn back to God while they still have time and to give them verses of encouragement. We thank you for this time we have together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week we covered what are the mysteries of God, what kind of things are called mysteries, so there were seven of them that we covered. And we also covered um, the mystery of Christ's crucifixion um, and the rest of the verse that the Lord has revealed these things to us from the Spirit, and they're only discerned by the Spirit. And then we talked about Romans 8, um, Isaiah 55, my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. However, we can have the mind of Christ through him. Um, Seek the Lord while he may be found and call him while he's near. That's sort of the audience here. And we read through that. And this. Um, and we actually explained Ecclesiastes 11.15, which seems to run counter grain, that you cannot understand the works of God or the maker of all things, but Paul and Christ tell us that we can through Christ. Um, and then Psalms 139 basically says, where can I go from your presence? You're omniscient, you're omnipotent and omnipresent. And um, then we talked about this, that God knows us completely. So perhaps he wants us to know him completely. Um, I think that's where we left off. Is that correct? Does anybody remember? I think we left off on this one. So, uh, Patsy, would you like to read this one for us? I've un unmuted you. Okay. Go ahead. Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm are work salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Wonderful. So... In this one, he's making it very plain that he has revealed his salvation to everyone, not just the Jews, and that the, the faithfulness to Israel will extend to the rest of the world, which is quite powerful. And we know that to be in line with the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, uh, let's see. Fonda, can you read this one? Bonda, you have to undo your, your mute. I'll try it. I'm trying to unmute them, but it doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, unmute all. Okay, Roger, you want to read that one from, from John 15, 12? All right. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this. To lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father. I have made known to you. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So in this short little passage is almost the essence of everything we're supposed to do in our lives for the Lord. He's not only telling us to love each other, but the greatest love is this, is to lay our lives down for each other. And he says, our relationship here has changed. In the past, what did the people who worship God always say about themselves? Anyone? They always said that they were, you know, unworthy servants or slaves and Christ is changing the relationship because he can, he's the one who chose us. That's what it says very clearly here. And he chose us to bear much fruit. So he's basically saying in this, not only did I choose you, not only have I brought you to myself so that you'll bear much fruit and fruit that will last, but also I've changed our relationship. You're now considered a friend and the difference between a friend and a servant or, or a slave is what? He tells us there's one word that changes the relationship. He knows, what is. he knows what's going on. The Lord has revealed to Christ his plans and Christ has revealed that to us. So instead of dwelling in ignorance, the relationship has changed. And that's miraculous for all of us. So the next one from 1 Corinthians 15, 50, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and this mortal with immortality. So one of the passages I love so much about Christ's resurrection from the dead is when the bodies of the righteous come back to life in Jerusalem and they go visit their families. It's incredible. It's in chapter 28 of Matthew. And it's a microcosm of what might happen when Christ returns. And I really hope it does because we would have no better verification that Christ had returned than our own deceased relatives coming to visit us. It's pretty amazing. Um, first Corinthians 15, of course, and first Thessalonians chapter four, Daniel 12 and Isaiah 26 all give us a composite picture of what this resurrection is going to be, plus the 10 parables that talk about resurrection. Um, so this is one of the little mysteries that we're gonna be changed. You know, our, our, our dead relatives will probably come and get us and we'll go with them and we'll meet the Lord um, and they receive the judgment. So it's an incredible thing for us to consider. <clears throat> when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that has been written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, sorry, where death is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. So we have taken hold of this mystery of resurrection and that this is going to happen to us, um, that we're going to be fully known to the Lord and he's fully known to us. Let's go to the next slide. Sorry. So in Dan, oh, whoops, skipped back. In Daniel chapter 4, it says, The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid, honor, paid him honor and ordered that an offering of incense be presented to him. 
the king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. If you think about it, this whole scenario is so bizarre. Okay, for 285 years, the major and minor prophets had all warned Israel, stop rebelling against the Lord, stop oppressing the poor, take care of the widow, the fatherless, and the alien. And he also told them, if you don't stop this, I'm going to send you to another brutal country, and for 70 years, you are going to be captive there. So out of the captivity of the Jews who went, we have all these major prophets who come out of this. We have Daniel revealing the entire timeline of mankind for a king that was there for a moment and gone that all the world benefits from. And he was a captive. So was Esther. So was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys have so many strikes against them for just being foreigners in a foreign land. And yet they're the ones who get to reveal to not just Nebuchadnezzar, but to the whole world what God intends to do. So he is the great revealer of mysteries. And it's kind of a shock that he takes this young man who's a captive from Israel to be the king's advisor, not just for one king or two kings, but for four kings in two different empires. It's incredible. So he is a God of mysterious ways, just in this. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, it says, So then, let us apostles be looked upon as ministering servants of God and stewards of the mysteries, the secret purposes of God. Now, I want you to think about that on an individual basis, how extraordinary it is that all through the centuries, the secrets that have been revealed to us that we don't get excited about anymore because they're just, oh, we've heard this all of our lives. These are the things that saints of old wanted to know and they never got to hear it. They never got to participate in it. So we should be a enthusiastic stewards of these mysteries that God has revealed to share with the rest of the world because they don't know it. And I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Roger can be a testimony to this on this. When I went out to Rutgersville and presented, you know, God's hand is in it all to 55 Baptists, they were stunned. They had never heard this stuff before. Never. Same thing in New Smyrna Baptist Church. They've never heard this stuff. And it's all about God's glory. And it's like, every time we get a chance as Christadelphians to share what we believe, we shy away from it because we automatically assume there's no righteousness here. They don't want to hear it. They don't know it. And they're not interested. But they are. And we are stewards who can reveal these hidden things to a, a whole new generation. Um, Roger, could you read this one for me? Mute yourself and read that one, please. Okay, hang on. Am I got? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, now I got to get back. I had. To... All right. Um, <clears throat> Colossians one. Paul's labor for for the church. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of His body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To bring God <clears throat> as chosen to, excuse me, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. 
To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Now, can we say this last part about ourselves? Is that it? <laughs> yep. What? Each of you are a gemstone in the hand of God. You reflect his perfect light into the world so that they will know his mysteries. Exactly. Um, so these riches are riches indeed. And he says, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. In other words, they're all reaching their full potential and Christ wanted, sorry, Paul wanted to see that. With every Gentile he converted, what do you think he saw? Anyone? Anyone? Your... A new gem. Yeah. I think it's have, you ever, a... have you ever walked down the street and seen and seen someone and go like, wow, I wish they were a part of our church. Wow, I wish they were a fellow believer because they're such a great person and yet they don't know God. I think there's, uh, in Malachi, it, it, I think, I can't remember it right off, but it speaks about him when, in the day when he makes up his jewels. Yeah, yeah but it's Malachi says, then those who spoke often with one another, the Lord wrote a book of remembrance and says, they will be mine. On the day when I make up my treasured possession, you will see how he basically gathers his gemstones um i said you'll again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked and those who serve god and those who do not so the the goal of, is not just for ourselves to be fully mature in christ and reach our full potential the goal is is for roger and fonda and linda and patsy and walter and everybody else who's listening to help other people reach their full potential in Christ. It's like being a life coach and helping them get to where they need to go by encouragement. Um, so let's see, Patsy, can you read this one from Ephesians chapter one? Ephesians one. <clears throat> Praise be to God and, and Father of our Lord Je Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blame blameless in his sight. In love, he, predest in love, he predestined us to us for adoption to son sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely, freely given us the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his, of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and under, and earth under Christ. So right there, we have our marching room. We're told we're adopted. We're told we're going to be made blameless. We're, we're told that we were predestined for this, that in accordance with his will, that through Christ, because Christ revealed his mysteries to us, that we can put these things to effect. But what's the end goal on heaven and on earth? What is the goal? It begins with the U, ends with the Y. Anyone? You can type it in if you can't say it. Thank you, Walter. It's unity. And why is unity so important? Do we have any unity in our government? Yeah. On Capitol Hill? 
Uh, among the states, among the nations, is there is the United Nations actually united? The very word unity means we mean one. Yeah. And togetherness. So you have the same mind and intention, which is that God is always one, for us to be out of his mind as the sun was one. Exactly. So if we're use if we're using our energy and our efforts to bring about unity of mind, unity of purpose, then we will achieve great things. But if we're looking to be divisive, we're working against God in a way to cause division and strife. So when Christ comes back, his thousand year reign is gonna be subjugating all the peoples, nations, language and ethnicities on earth to himself, everybody. Um, and you know, it's been impossible for us as a nation to do that. So. We'll see what happens. So question, if God has revealed on us the mysteries of his will and his love, and we are adopted by God as his children, and Christ calls us to be his friend, then what is the purpose of his will revealed? We've talked about this, the time of, to reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. So our objective is not to bring everybody in unity under ourselves. Our objective is, is to bring everybody in unity into Christ on earth and in heaven. And why is there a division when people think they're bringing unity about? Exactly. So if we want everybody to be unified because I want you to agree with me, is that unity? Not really. So the whole point is, is that everything should be unified on heaven and on earth under Christ. Ephesians 3 says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace and that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation that I have already brief, written, brief, uh, written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So Paul is again iterating that as the Gentiles have come in, God's grace and his understanding has gone on directly to them. Even though the Jews at the time not only rejected Christ and rejected all of it, they didn't want to know the mysteries, they wanted to stay in darkness, so it leapfrogged right to the Gentiles, and it's pretty powerful to think about. Um, Roger, would you like to read this one? Uh, Ephesians 3, <clears throat> 5, which, which was not made known to people in our generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise in Jesus Christ. I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. So it's something that the Jews could never fathom that the Gentiles and the Jews would be joint heirs so the real cure for racism and division and strife and all of it is christ he's the glue that brings it all together and he's saying this mystery has been revealed to us that this is what god intends to bring everybody into subjection by christ to me who am less than the least of all the saints this grace was given that i should preach among the gentiles the unsearchable riches of christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in god who created all things through jesus christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of god might be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose for which he accomplished it in christ jesus our lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through the faith in him. Therefore, I ask that whatever you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, 
which is your glory. So in another way, that's another mystery that's revealed is that our tribulations for one another are for each other's benefit. Now we never usually think about it like that, but when one person is suffering, the whole body is suffering, yet it's for the good of all. Um, a long time ago, I, I read in this book and it stuck with me, and it really was a good thing. It says, Why did God bless us? Everybody asked the question, Why do you bless your way? Why am I bless my way? Yo, can you all hear Walter okay? No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, can fix that, I, think. I can't hear him either. Can y'all hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the question I asked, you're going to have to mute yourself. All right. Hang on. All right. That's better. Yeah. All right. Still echoing. Somebody else has a mic on. Nobody else has a mic on but you. Oh, well. <laughs> well, we'll just have to and muted. Thank. All right. What's the question I asked? Um, the question was, why is it that God blesses each one of us in the way that He blesses us? And I'd read a book a long time ago, and what they suggested is this: that God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to everyone else. So each level of blessing He gives us is something we impart to everyone else so that we can be like him who richly blesses everyone. So. Can y'all hear Joe back there? No. <laughs> I, I'll unmute them and see if they have any other thoughts. I can't unmute them. But I can go try. <laughs> Right. So Joe's wanting to know what y'all's opinion is, and I'm going to mute myself so I stop echoing. So what Joseph was looking for was what y'all's opinion is on that thought. It's okay. We'll just move on. Sorry about that. Um, further, it says... For this reason, I bow the knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might through his Holy Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints that, what is, sorry, what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So in this, it's asking us to fathom not only the riches of God, but also through the Holy Spirit that we can understand the parameters, the measurement of Christ's love for us, which is quite impossible. So, the glory of God is to conceal the matter, and to search out a matter is the glory of kings. So we know this hide-and-seek sort of thing has been going on through all of history, 
with the different kings, but now it's been revealed to us. So Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 says, So do you not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. So the question is, so what is the end goal of the Lord? Um, the answer is full understanding, full knowledge, and for the presence of God to dwell in everyone. And this is confirmed through Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, where it says, They will neither harm nor destroy at all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that should be a tremendous comfort. I know it is to me when I'm 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm worried about something. I imagine the knowledge of God surpassing the earth by that much. Romans 11 says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may be, not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come to Zion. He will turn godliness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as the election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call is irrevocable. That should be a real comfort as well to all of us. And he doesn't want us to dwell in ignorance. God's goal is for all of us to be fully knowledgeable about what's going on. Why I think this is such a revelation. Compare God's economy to man's economy. In God's economy, you have a purpose. You have a reason for being. You are predestined for something. He wants you to be completely fulfilled. He wants you to reach your full potential. He wants you to have unity with the rest of the family. With God, sorry, within man's world, you're always expendable. You're always replaceable. You're disposable. You will never reach your full potential in man. He'll never let you. And there's always <laughs> um, strife, jealousy, and everything else. Is God jealous when you succeed in him? No. Is man jealous when you succeed? Constantly. So God's economy is abundance. Man's, bank, man, man's economy is bankrupt. We're seeing that now quite literally. So the Lord is not greedy. He is generous. And man is the opposite. And that's why I think this is so astounding for us. Um, Patsy, can you read this one? Romans eleven thirty, just as you who, who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so too, so they too have now become disobedient, in the order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him, are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much. That's very good. So we've talked about this depth of riches and wisdom and understanding um, before many times. It's revealed to the righteous. It's withheld from the wicked. The reason we know that is also in Romans because he says these things are spiritually discerned. The key to understanding all of it is the Holy Spirit, which we sometimes as believers hardly ever talk about. But they cannot be revealed by just man. In Romans 16, 
And it says, now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for a long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings of the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Another concept I want you to think about. These were the last few years Israel, sorry, the Jews were going to be in their own land. From Christ's death until 70 AD was roughly 40 years. These were the last moments. They didn't accept his message. They rejected it. Paul wiped the dust of his shoes off and he went to the Gentiles. Here's the ironic thing. Paul made every effort, as did the disciples, to get them to believe. They dismissed him. They said, we've already got the truth. We don't need yours. So he left and he said, I will make the Gentiles. You will be jealous of what I'm going to reveal to the Gentiles and you'll never taste it. So after 70 AD, where did all these Jews wind up? In all these Christian nations. And for 2000 years, they would be persecuted at the highest level. I've got a book sitting right over here. It's a Atlas of Judaism of all the places they have been expelled and thrown around all over the earth. And they were mistreated, called Christ killers and everything else for 2000 years. And yet almost none of them ever assimilated because it was such an affront. And now they're back in their homeland and we've reached the end of the age of the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles are becoming atheistic and agnostic all over Europe, all over North and South America. People are leaving. And so it's about to become a nation of priests when Christ returns. And then the Jews will be the ones who will teach the whole world about Christ again. So it's flip-flop through history. It only started off with the Hittite himself, Abraham, because of his faithfulness. He had a son. He said, because you were willing to sacrifice your son and not withhold him from me. That's the reason. Because you understand my feelings when I give up my only son. That the whole rest of the world is going to be blessed, Abraham, because you were willing to do this. And I guarantee you, no one else would. And God could see that all through history. That Abraham was before and after him. Nobody was going to be willing to do this. And so that's why he made a great nation. Not because the Jews in the wilderness weren't stubborn, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and difficult. And the Lord was really to slay them at any moment. But now we've come full circle. We're at the age of the Gentiles when they're about, they're just giving away this treasure for free. It doesn't matter to us anymore. It's just like the Jews were in Christ's time. We've already got it. What do we need? We don't need anything else. And they're throwing it away. We're seeing people, people always think um, believers are, are leaving Christadelphia. Is that so? Are they just leaving Christadelphians? Are they also leaving the Baptists? Are they also leaving the Methodists? Are they also leaving the Episcopalians? I guarantee you, if I were to show you graphs and charts of all the denominations that have lost all their young people, we would not stand alone. They all are losing their young people. So it's, it's a sad commentary, but it's not just our story. It's because prophecy is being fulfilled. It's the end of the age of the Gentiles, and it's coming to pass. <clears throat> um, Patsy, can you read this one? Deuteronomy 5.22. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to you, to your whole assembly there on the mountain, from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness, and added nothing more. 
Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness while the mountain was ablaze with fire, all the leaders of your tribes, your elders came to me and you said, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his majesty and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now why should we die? This great fire will consume us and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. So that's the, the Jews interpretation. We don't wanna hear from God. The, the fire is gonna consume us even though every single time it's not going to. And go ahead and finish it, Patsy. On the slide, Patsy. Where, I, uh, where, did, where did I leave off? Oh. You're, you're starting on, this is the next one. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, okay, I see. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near, listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells us. We will listen and obey. The Lord heard you when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and to keep all my commandments always, so that I might dwell well with them and their children forever. Go tell them to return to their tents. But you stay here with me so that I may give you all the commandments, decrees, and laws you are to teach them to follow in the land that I am giving them to possess. So I want you to think about this as a giant science experiment. This moment on Mount Sinai, when they received the law from God, and there was fire, and there was a trumpet blast, and there was smoke, and there was lightning. And the people were afraid, and they didn't want to talk to God anymore. They said, Moses, you go talk to God. You come back and tell us what he said, okay? We're done. We don't want to see God, and we don't want to talk to him. So this was a paradigm shift for the rest of history. Did God talk directly with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob? Did he give them dreams? Yep, he dealt with them directly. He dealt directly with Joseph. He dealt directly with all of them. But now, with Moses, they had the opportunity to become a kingdom of priests, to be a, a people who directly got to talk with God. At Mount Sinai, they divorced them. They sent him away. And Christ brings up this point, and so does Paul in the New Testament. He says, for when the old law is read to them, the same veil remains over their faces. It's the same veil of ignorance. They don't want to know it. Don't talk to us, God. Leave us alone. Send somebody to come talk to us. So this is like a seismic shift in the way God had been dealing with his faithful because his own people said, nope, we don't want to talk to you. You send us a note, send us an email, you send us a text, and we'll, we'll talk. But God's heartbroken here. He says, oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep my commandments always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. And so he gives up and he says, go tell them to return to their tents. Maybe I'm being a little dramatic here, but I think he's very disappointed. I think he really wanted to have a bond with each and every one of them. And we see it again, I think you, in case you think I'm making this up, when all the elders were told to assemble at the, at the tabernacle with their censers, and they received the Holy Spirit and started prophesying, right? Well, two of the elders didn't come. Me dad and El dad. Don't know what their names mean. Don't know why they were procrastinators. Don't know why they couldn't be timely. But they didn't come. And they started prophesying in the camp. 
And who got upset? Joshua, son of Nun, came to Moses and he says, Lord, stop them. And he's like, are you jealous for me? He says, I wish all God's people were priests and prophets. Because guess what? That is the end goal for this nation. It's not just going to be the Levites. It's going to be all of them are going to have the responsibility to teach the world how to serve God. When you read that passage, it says, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, that he may teach us his ways and his righteousness. That's because these people will have their hearts changed, and they'll be teaching a, a whole new generation of Gentiles who doesn't know God anymore because they've rejected him. In Corinthians, it says, Now if the ministry that was brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so the Israelites could not look steadfastly on the face of Moses because of his glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the mystery that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious had no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. If what was transitory came through glory, how much greater is the glory that which lasts? So Moses was told to put a veil over his face, and his face was fading even while he was standing in front of them. And that glory is nothing to be compared with Christ's glory. And you get an image of that, I believe, in Ezekiel one of the other minor prophets, and you get it in Revelations, where he says his eyes were burning and his body was like burning coal and his brightness was so incredible. Um, and the point to us is this, thing, this passage from Paul to the Corinthians is talking about the same moment we just read about. Mount Sinai, the giving of the law, the inspiration, and that they didn't want it. And guess what? Do people want the light of Christ? Or do they want to have it hidden? So the point is, is that if they didn't like the light before, people are really not going to like the light now. Because it's so bright. And nothing can be hidden from it. Because it's that bright. So we want to go about... Our mission, our action statement is to go about and be veil snatchers. You know, take away the veils. Let people see the full light because they're only getting pieces of it. Um, and we've been given so much as believers, so much understanding from the New to the Old Testament. We're not handicapped. All the myths and lies have been told for the last 2,000 years on top of Christianity. We've had stripped away. We have a golden opportunity to tell people something they really don't know and would be happy to bear witness about. Roger, can you read this one? Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we all are very bold. We are not like Moses. We are not like Moses. What happened to the rest? Hang on. Hang on. All right. I, I got remunity. Um, we're not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day that same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, a being transformed into his image, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, he's making an emphatic case about what happened. He's making an emphatic case about what happened at Mount Sinai. 
And he's saying, look, these people did not want to see Moses' face. They didn't want to talk to God. They didn't want to hear the law. And he's saying, for everybody who dwells in ignorance, everybody who doesn't understand, a veil is over their heart, not just their face, but over their heart. So they can't perceive. They can't understand. And he's saying, anybody who turns to Christ, that veil is snatched away. It is taken away. And it's done through the Spirit. So that we with unveiled faces can be transformed into what God wants us to be, into being more like him. Anybody remember having a real camera with real film in it? Anybody remember those days? Vaguely. Vaguely. Well, my dad was a great photographer and he mostly took slides. But what I remember making a pinhole camera when I was in Boy Scouts and I thought it was so cool, you know, this image is upside down inside of a box. And it was just very, very cool to me. But if you think about that analogy with us, we're like undeveloped film. We are put in to the camera, which is our life, and the aperture is opened. And however much light we receive during our lifetime is the closer we get to the image outside, which is God. So in our lifetime, we can become as much or as little like God as we choose. It depends on how wide we open the aperture and how much we are exposed to the light. Um, so all of this is just a, an analogy to talk about what the refusal was at Mount Sinai and the paradigm shift that happened there when God wanted to talk directly to his people and his people said, nope, you just talk to Moses and tell him to come talk to us. Thank you, that's it. And that's the way God treated the Jews from that moment on. From then on, they had to have prophets and seers and other people come to them and tell them God's message. They never got it directly. Enough. And Christ is changing that for us. Roger, are you muted? No. I'm muting you, buddy. Okay. Okay, I'm unmuted. I know, we couldn't hear. Okay. <laughs> Okay. If in Christ our veil is taken away, then what is our purpose once we can look at the full light of truth with all of its mystery is revealed to us? I'll leave that as a question for you guys to answer on your own. The answer would be the world veil snatcher by removing the veil of ignorance from everybody around us and by exposing them to the truth. And it's, it's a responsibility. You know, those who've been given much, much is expected of them. Um, my revealed mysteries, write down what mysteries you possess from your faith that the world does not know that you can share with others. List at least 12. Who can you share this with? Think about who in your life could begin sharing your beliefs with and snatching the veil of ignorance away. List at least 20. Strategies. Write down a list of strategies you can use to share what you believe with others. Include at least seven. So that's your homework assignment for next week. Twelve mysteries, twenty things you can share, and seven strategies. Almost 40 minutes. So... Um, We'll conclude with that tonight. Am I early or am I on time? Okay. Well, I'll just if you guys can remember that, I'd like for you to I'd like to hear from some some of you on this. So we're gonna start class two after this next week, and we're gonna start talking about deciphering a God of mysterious ways. So all this was a prelude to what we're gonna be going through. So again, um, if you can think about these mysteries that you want to share who you can share them with and some strategies that will be great roger would you like to close the class okay
Dear Heavenly Father, God of Israel, once again, we thank you for the opportunity to meet with each other, even though we are unable to be in the same room with each other. Now, as we go to our separate homes and uh, constantly have to deal with this uh, judgment that you brought upon the earth, help us to live in it as best we can, knowing that you have decided who it is for. And we pray that you give us strength and, uh, and that we conduct ourselves well in it and give us peace for we all struggle with it in some way and it can be very stressful. Help us to know that it's temporary and that it is, it is an acceleration to the end, uh, not something that will just burden the earth and with no resolve. We know that the labor pains of the earth have very much started now in a way we've never seen before. And we pray for the birth of times when all things will be made new again. So bless us as we go our separate ways and watch over and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you guys so much.